Hello, Trigger Proof family. It's nice to be back and sharing this transmission with you. If you're watching again, if you're watching this on replay, give me a hashtag replay. I just want to know what you got out of this. I want to know what uh, what inspiring action are you looking to take from this training. Facebook's a funny thing. It can either be used to distract you or it could actually be used to awaken you. If you're brand new to this community, welcome. This is the first time. <laughs> hey Al, what's up my brother? Um, if this is your first time here, you're brand new to this community, welcome. I want you to know that you belong. You're either here because the content was interesting to you and you wanted to actually look um, look into learning how to become better at mastering your nervous system or somebody that cares about you who's been following along is like damn like you gotta learn this stuff because we are talking about all things nervous system with respect to interpersonal relationships let me say that again we're here to learn how to master our nervous systems with respect to interpersonal relationships why is that important well I know what it's like to be in the space where should I stay or should I go? Should I stay or should I go from this relationship? Let me know if you can relate to that, if that resonates with you. Should I stay or should I go? Or I know what it's like to be so governed by outside things. You know, when things don't go your way, when you feel rejected by somebody, when somebody makes a comment to you, keyboard warriors, or clients maybe you're a chiropractor you're uh, you're a doctor you're a dentist you're a practitioner of some sort you're a healer uh, you have clients that come to you and you become extremely dependent on their feedback positive feedback towards you in order for you to feel okay looking in a mirror I know what that's like it's something that's you know a work in progress isn't it and so trigger proof doesn't actually mean trigger less if you're new, you've heard me say, if you're new, you're going to hear me say this again and again because I get hate hate mail all the time. It's impossible for you to not be triggered, to make yourself trigger-proof. I don't mean trigger-less. I mean to be able to stretch the gap. What I discovered is my ability, if I could learn how to stretch the gap between stimulus and response, my relationship with myself completely changes. No, in other words, in order for me to be able to do that, I need to have a completely different relationship with myself. So to grow into the kind of person that could stretch the gap authentically without repressing or suppressing, stretch the gap between stimulus and response, I can then change my interpersonal relationships, my business, I can create a pause, and then I actually have the power to choose my own adventure. That's how powerful this work is to expand that space and really prioritize making your nervous system uh, a safe place inside you. Why is this important? Well, because you, have, you might have children. You might have a business. If you have anything, like I was, you know, I've been single pretty much most of the last 10 years. Single and uh, single, not, not married no real responsibilities but now why this is really important to me uh, we'll do that right away Leslie uh, why is that really important to me is because I'm married now and I have a child on the way okay I have a child on the way and I know that every single thing that my wife is going through right now with this COVID stuff is actually impacting the nervous system of my kid so all of a sudden I created this Facebook group to give people tools to be able to master their nervous systems and Leslie just said I need a good stretch so that would be a good place to start if you could just stand up for a moment while you're scrolling through maybe you're on the if you're on the can you don't have to do that please wipe first and then get up and stretch I'm gonna get you to stand up and get connected with your breath because we're gonna talk today about the five that famous post the five regrets of the dying and I'm gonna unpack each and every one of those regrets and show you why 
it's unfair to expect you to have anything else other than those regrets and how to change that so that on your deathbed you have a different experience this was a big one for me i had to i looked at those and i was like whoa i got to i got to unpack this so i learned how to master it so that my deathbed experience is much different and i want to show you exactly what needs to happen in order for you to have a different one so the first thing we're going to do is i'm just going to get you to stand and stretch and when you stretch here's a good one you can do this each and every day because we're keyboard warriors we're constantly hunched forward or if you're a chiropractor you're hunching over people quite a bit so your stretch you're gonna do and I got this you're gonna twist your arms outward like that you're gonna twist it outward and you're gonna open up and you're gonna notice maybe some clicking there's an opening that happens just do that take three deep breaths and on each one surrender the exhale get back into your body because this transmission is really important for you to take notes on and really embody and I want to get I want you to get this so you understand if you're brand new welcome let me know where you're signing in from right now let me know where you're signing in I'm just curious and if you see something that's an aha for you and an aha or something that resonates go ahead in the comment section and tell me exactly what came up because I'm about to tell you these five regrets I promise you you've read this um, before I think it was written by a nurse in palliative care or something who spoke to many people as they were passing and transitioning and she said there was five uh, regrets now don't quote me on who it was but just look it up the five regrets of the dying you'll be able to see it easy to find the first one and I'm gonna unpack each of them for you number one is I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me let me say that again you can even write that down regret number one of the dying I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me now why will that likely be a regret for you if you don't really figure this out here's why you were born into a matrix of religious beliefs of societal norms and your parents 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 traumas that have been passed down to you and in the very best way they knew how especially if they were religious and they didn't want you to go to hell oh no they are going to do everything they can to protect you from that so oftentimes in their fears and their own inadequacies will place certain expectations on you as that first prison in other words here's the expectation as a parent if my kid doesn't reach that then I'm a fucking failure as a parent and I sure as shit don't want to be a failure as a parent so I'm gonna put up these expectations now I already can feel them coming up for me I'm about to have a baby now I already can feel that oh my kids gonna be the healthiest my kids gonna be the best dressed my like I literally am already game planning traumatizing the shit out of them <laughs> and I can't control it it's actually part of me because I want to be the best parent because if I'm not then I can't love myself so based on my own incomplete woundings I am going to place certain expectations unconsciously on my child that's what happened likely to you because it happened to me as well and this isn't blaming my parents this is stepping back on what I call the overview effect that's why I call it the overview method is this is what we do in our workshops we actually get you to step back and realize where all of this is coming from so the regret of I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me you couldn't have done it any other way because as you were growing up if you did what was expected you would often receive a reward of love and if you didn't do what was expected 
and you didn't have parents that understood nervous system regulation and attunement because this is all recent stuff the polyvagal theory and attachment theory it's all within the last 10 years so it takes a good generation for things for things to catch up in the way that we're doing things i'm sharing with you new cutting edge stuff in the last 10 years science of polyvagal theory and the attachment theory which if you didn't have that experience of being loved just for your beingness not what was expected you are unconsciously conditioned to do what's expected then you go to a school system and that school system sure as shit has a step-by-step -step process that was given in to a formula that you must follow these in order to have a pass or a fail in other words it was is, how else are they going to do it obviously we got to this is the curriculum this is what you got to learn this is what the government's telling you to learn if you pass then you're approved of if you don't hmm, and this is what's expected is a minimum of so and so so i we're all brought into that exact same um i can really see you wanting them to be the best dressed yeah 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 i mean i i i i i get uh i get uh you know relaxed and comfortable uh attire but you know we're we're not looking to dress our kid poorly right <laughs> but the point is is that these expectations are are unavoidable until we start to reach the, our 20s and 30s where we start to go wait a second i've been working so hard all my life to please a system a church good evil right wrong good bad uh, pass fail there's always these expectations that I can't love myself just for my beingness I don't even know who I am so naturally you will get into relationships and please or have these conflicts because you haven't yet taken the time to understand these this matrices that you've been born into and learn the incredible amount of trauma and, and do the work of the incredible amount of trauma it takes to break free from that system you don't think it's traumatic breaking free from all those systems of 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 oppression and expectation try talking to a jehovah's witness who has has left their congregation whoa it's it's traumatic um societal like it's 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 pretty traumatic to break free from the systemic expectation and so naturally with that unresolved with that fear of abandonment because it's in our dna it's in our nervous system to actually fit in with society because going outside of the grain and being individualistic pretty much meant that you weren't going to survive so it's in our nervous systems to try to fit in it's what we naturally try to do and then without resolving this without doing the deep inner work it takes to break free what happens is you then end up on your deathbed and it's like now the truth comes out now it's like hey you're about to die so looking back what's what's the point and you're in that moment you're like wow i wish i had the courage to break free from those spells those imaginary spells why well so i could live a life that was actually authentic to me because now i'm at the end of my life and i realize that i've just been living it for other people and waiting to get approval trying to be a good girl or a good boy and be nice and tick off the boxes and do what's appropriate and now what you're realizing is now you have the fundamental reason why people have depression why there are so many breakdowns in relationships because as uh, as um james hollis says the first half of life is a gigantic mistake it's the unconscious revelation that you've been living under these systems just for the sake of approval rather than learning the courage the tools it takes to break free and it takes courage took me a lot of courage whoa geez wasn't speaking to my family for a while it was traumatic but i now live a life that is you know true to myself and in order to do that i had to go through some big time fractures with my family 
when I said I want to leave chiropractic and I want to start teaching. Woo! I that was tough, and now I can see it as my father and mother really working to loving me because they had their fears, and if I didn't fit into that box, then they would it would be about them. Does that make sense? So that's the first one and why it's so common. Let me know if you can resonate. If that one resonates with you, let me know. I can resonate with that one. I'd love to hear your feedback. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Regret number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. You know what? I realized I was codependent with my work. I realized I was living with a codependency with my work. I was working so hard. I didn't know how to take a break. I was seven days a week answering everyone who messaged me. I had to answer them right away. And I realized that working hard used to be a badge of honor. But what it is, is as it's actually, in my case, I don't know if you, you can resonate. In my case, it was a response to trauma. In other words, I was working hard not because I was inspired to be working. I was working hard because it was a trauma response, because I was living in scarcity trauma, in the soup of not enoughness, that one day everything was all going to be taken away from me. Everything was going to be taken away from me. It's all going to come crashing down. I'm not safe. I need to work hard to produce in order to survive because I'm going to die because I live, I was working hard, not because I was inspired and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a meaningful project. No, that's different. Your nervous system works differently when you're doing that. When you're working hard because you don't feel safe and you're going to die and starve is going on in your body, what'll happen is you then miss out on relationships. You then miss out on meaning. And then you get to the end of your life and then you say, hey, you know, you talk to the nurse or whoever, the palliative care person. Hey, tell me what's going on. I wish, wish I didn't work so hard. And so this has been something that I've been working on extensively. And I can honestly say that now I'm working less than I ever have. And the work is most meaningful to me. And, and, and I get to show up not from a, I used to show up an anxious mess trying to fix everybody working hard so that I could feel safe now I show up full with a heart open saying how can I contribute there's a huge difference and why it's because I worked on my scarcity traumas and I'm working on excuse me because it's a work in progress the work doesn't just stop it's an ongoing living thing and it's lifelong. I've just learned the tools to be able to take what's in front of me and alchemize it into inspiration so that I'm not working 24 seven. Yeah, it's true. There's times where I kind of spin into work mode where when I'm lucky to have a wife next to me going, all right, put the phone away. You don't need to answer your clients right away. You don't need to answer them now. You don't need, to, they're not a client. So you don't need to give them like all of the guidance, point them to your video. So she's been helping me a lot in that. And my nervous system feels totally different now. I feel safe in my body now. And I'm working not from a place of desperation. I'm working actually from a place of inspiration. And I can contribute more. I, I don't know, since this group started, if you scroll back, I probably there's easily at least 50 hours of training and content for you. You could literally have a whole library of, of, of guidance for helping you get back and centered into your body. Does that make sense? So that was um, number two, was I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Well, the truth of the matter is you will work hard when you're living with scarcity trauma and not enoughness. So you can wish that you stop, but you can't stop it because your body's naturally doing it because of those old woundings. Your answer is to actually, if you want to stop doing that, you got to heal the parts of you that don't feel like they're enough. Otherwise, you then create a codependent relationship with your clients, your work, which is where I was. It's codependent. 
not just in you know, co codependent in my personal relationship, I was codependent with work. Talk about lack of freedom. Talk about uh, a regret, you know. So number three, regret number three. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Now that's an interesting one. You're going to go to the end of your life and you're going to go back. You're going to look back and go, you know, I didn't know how to express my feelings. I didn't know how to share them in a way that would be, it would land on other people. And for good reason, you didn't know. For good reason, that will be a regret. Because ever since you were younger, you had parents that didn't know what to do with their feelings. And so when they didn't know what to do with their feelings, when your big feelings would come up, how would they respond to you? What was the likely response that you would get? The response that you would get is, shh, don't cry, don't, 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 suppression. Why? Because when you would have big feelings, your parents would make your feelings about them and their failure, cause a reaction, and then cause them to judge, abandon, blame, or shame you. Or completely... Um, invalidate you because they didn't know how to deal with their own feelings and guess what you're doing to your kid unconsciously unconsciously by the way this isn't a blame game once you really step out and look from overview you realize there's really no one to blame we're all in this together we're actually we're all connected in the same way we're literally all the same so when we start working with our clients I remember the best example of this is is laser laser is one of the clients that I've been working with we've been working with he is uh, a guy who is a phenomenal guy he just didn't know what feelings were he came to my overview experience he was like all he knew was he was just stuck in his life was lacking intimacy and lacking connection to purpose that's how the symptoms show up your symptoms will show up is lacking intimacy lacking a connection with yourself uh, lacking real like feeling with others like there's no there's no connection energetically emotionally there's no emotional attunement so there's no intimacy there's no connection to higher self your heart is closed that's how it shows up that's the symptom you'll notice just as a precursor to ending on the deathbed going I wish I had the courage to share my feelings well you have no you can't share them if you don't have fucking access to them does that make sense? And most of us don't because we've been spending so much time stuffing them down, packaging them up, numbing them, trying to distract by pleasing, serving, rescuing, fixing others so that we don't have to deal with our own. So naturally, we don't know how to express them because we don't know how to feel them. And for you to, for you to think that it's going to be any different for you other other unless you actually do the deep inner work the shadow work of of connecting to your feelings which is a huge leap for most people people come to our trainings there's this one uh one woman who came to our training uh just just this weekend uh sunday we did the overview experience where we go and we reconnect with the younger parts of us and afterwards i was like so how was it because this was her first time she goes as soon as i like saw my inner child uh, I couldn't feel her and I just got a splitting headache and then I checked out. I'm like, that's exactly the natural response from being so dissociated from yourself. And she lives lack of emotion. There's no intimacy in her marriage. Okay? There's none. She can't feel him. How, how the hell can she feel him? She can't even feel herself. She goes in and here's what the main obstacle is for you. The main obstacle for you to share your feelings is your inability to feel them. And the main obstacle of your inability to feel them comes from the fact that they were so painful when you were younger that it was safer for you to just leave your body. It just felt safer for you to leave your body than to actually go in and feel them. So in those cases, to prevent that, it's wise for you to find a guide that's going to create a safe container for you to actually go and sink back and release back into those emotions and hold space for you while you do them without making you wrong or blaming you and then teaching you how to return back to you how to turn and then did you just experience me holding space for you wow great 
let's teach you how to do that for yourself. That's the obstacle from you sharing your feelings. If you can't turn around and just be able to hold space for yourself while you're having them, then there's no way that you're going to be able to do that for another person or there's no way you're going to be able to share your feelings vulnerably because you haven't learned how to hold space for them. How are you supposed to share your, have the courage to share your feelings if you don't know how to hold space for them? So of course that's going to be one of the regrets of the dying. Nobody teaches us that. We learn from our parents what to do with our feelings. Do parents share feelings? Hey, I've never heard this from my parents. Nima, you've gone through some major struggle. Oh, during my divorce, excuse me. Nima, I understand you're getting a divorce and you must be feeling so hurt and scared and uncertain. I'm going to admit, I just want you to know that I'll be there for you. Uh, even though it brings up a deep feelings of guilt and shame because maybe we weren't the greatest role models and but you know that's painful but that's on me that's my responsibility I'm there for you do you think that my parents did that when I told them 10 years ago I was getting a divorce <laughs> do you actually think that that's that's what they said no guess what they said they said we told you so because they didn't know what to do with their feelings. They got triggered by it, and instead of being able to hold space for me, they turned around and blamed me. We told you so. Thanks, Mom and Dad. I appreciate that. So these are people that don't understand what to do with their feelings except to react to them. So one of the regrets of the dying, number three, is I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Well, you first have to have the courage to feel them. Nobody really taught us that. We did the opposite. You must learn to master that. If you don't, you will have that regret on your deathbed. Now, it's going to take courage to feel them. It's going to take courage to express them. But courage is not just magically, poof, produced out of thin air. Courage is produced when you step in to doing things when you're scared. This is what stops most people from jumping in and actually doing the work. I'm scared. And then you come up with all these excuses, but it's just, I'm scared. And then, unfortunately, that fear then turns into a regret at the end of your life. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four. I wish I had the courage, no, not the courage, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Well, I had to look at that. When I was in my most anxious state and my nervous system was in sympathetic mode or dorsal vagal shutdown, so there's three modes, the ventral vagal, the top of the ladder where we feel connection, we feel presence, we feel laughter, play, that's our connecting uh, social engagement system is activated. When I get into sympathetic and dorsal, which are shutdown is the dorsal and sympathetic is the fight or flight, the dorsal vagal is the freeze response, the last thing I want to do is to connect with people. Let me say that again. When my nervous system is in sympathetic fight or flight or in dorsal, the last thing that I want to do is to connect with people. I want to avoid people at all costs. And so one month, I remember I went three months and I didn't even reach out to my brother when I was in my worst dorsal phase. So when you fast forward and you get to the end of your life, you look back and you go, you know, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends more. Well, this bonding and connecting that we do naturally when our nervous system is in ventral, where we want to engage socially, it's shut down. You're not going to stay in touch with your friends. It's all nervous system dependent. And when that's dysregulated, you're going to end up at the end of your life looking back going, I wish I stayed more in touch with my friends. It's true. I feel that already, and I'm not dead yet. And number five. I wish 
that I would have let myself be happier. Number five, I wish that I would have let myself be happier. It's kind of funny, right? You're at the end of your life, imagine you're on your deathbed, and then you look back and you're like, fuck, all that time I spent in misery, I could have actually spent feeling more connected. And it's a little bit, um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. You can easily say that. You can say that about last year, right? I wish I would have been happier because I'm still here. All that trauma and uncertainty that I was, you know, worried about all the time. I wish I would have just enjoyed it. I remember at a time there was a, a wedding I went to over, like, you know, overseas. It was a destination wedding. The whole time I was living in anxiety. I look back and they were like, oh, I see pictures of the wedding and I'm like, I wasn't really enjoying it. I was anxious the whole time. Is it wise for me to look back and go, I wish I would have let myself be happier? The problem is, is that you are unable to experience any connection, any fulfillment in the now if your nervous system is in sympathetic or dorsal. You can't experience it. You can't fake it. The only way to do that is to really expand your ventral experience, is to learn the tools of nervous system regulation so that you can identify and self-assess, oh, I'm in dorsal, oh, I'm in sympathetic right now, oh, I'm in ventral, we can expand on that. I've gotten myself to the point now where I'm like, oh, I'm in ventral. I just get myself into vent. I, 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 get into kind of like a meditative state and in that state I just game plan my day, my week, my life because I now know I've been able to self-assess and go, yeah, I'm in ventral right now. I'm connect with, connecting with people, uh, joking, playing, I'll turn on music and I'll dance. Like these are things, the activities that you do because your understanding of how your nervous system functions. So you can actually, instead of letting yourself be happier, you can create a sense of fulfillment and connection by activating your social engagement system and making that like one of the priorities of your life of learning how to master it. So if you don't, you're going to end up on your deathbed looking back going, Fuck, I wish I let myself be happier. Happiness, fulfillment, connection is not possible until you have safety in your body and that happens through the nervous system mastery. This is something that is very important to me. I learned that that has to be the priority in, in my life. Otherwise, nothing else works. My relationship doesn't work. Me as a father is not going to be effective. Me as a mentor, not going to happen. Um, me as a son, me as a brother, me as an uncle. It all depends on my nervous system. So the five regrets of the dying. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I hope you understand why now you will live as others expect of you unless you jump in and do like the deep inner work to break yourself from the matrix. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Well, you're going to work hard if you are basically feeling not safe in your body and you're working, working, working and doing, doing, doing as a distraction for a trauma response of not feeling safety. The funny thing happens when you take care of that part of you you're running away from, you can sit back and business comes to you. Business comes to you. I figured it out. <laughs> it was like a hack. It just came to me last week while I was on a road trip. I was like, the universe is slanted towards those that can help others be in a ventral state. That's the secret. So nobody's holding you back. The universe is slanted towards others, towards those people who can help put other people in a ventral vagal state because that's what's missing. Your clients. They need you to be, they need to be in ventral. That's what they're asking for. You don't know how to help them. They think that by getting the thing that you're selling or whatever, they're going to get in ventral. Um, that's why they're going to hire you. That's why you're, you know, you're employed. The more the ability that you're able to help assist others in their suffering and bring them up the ladder, the more successful you become. The problem is, are you able to do it for yourself? That's the key. That's what the focus of my trainings are all about is giving that to 
to people in, individually. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number three, I wish I had had the courage to express my feelings. Well, you know, you don't have the courage to express your feelings because you don't have the courage to feel them. And nobody actually walked you through and talked and shared with you how to do that. I wasn't. I had to actually learn. I'm like, what the hell are these feelings thing? So I had to take pause from trying to work and be relevant to actually going in and getting in touch with all that stuff. And it takes time to practice. You're not going to learn it over a weekend. It's going to take practice of unlearning the self-abandonment, unlearning the repression, unlearning the suppression of feelings for you to learn how to get in touch with them so that you can share them. Number four, I wish I had the courage. Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. When you're in dorsal vagal shutdown or sympathetic, you don't want to stay in touch with your friends. It's just how your nervous system is going to go. You need to learn how to clear that in order to um, stay in touch with your friends. And number five, I wish that I had let myself be happier. Well, how about I wish that I had learned how to create safety in my body, which opened up space for fulfillment. Hopefully that's been of service. Let me know what came up for you. If you have any questions, send me a DM. Uh, if you want to see my training on becoming trigger proof and you're brand new, you haven't seen it yet, anybody in this community, I have a free promo code for you. Just message me. Uh, I want the training and uh, I'll give it to you. And you're going to have to open up 90 minutes of space. You want to take a lot of notes. And my stipulation is you send me your three greatest takeaways. I would love to gift it to you for free, but you got to send me your three greatest takeaways from the training. Let me know if that's been relevant for you. And just check up above on our events. Circle the events that are coming up, the dates. Put them into your schedule, like save the date for our next breathwork and badassery and overview experience. Save the date. It's right above in the banner. Um, it's You don't want to miss them. If you're brand new, welcome. Let me know where you're from and what you would love ideally to learn more of, and I'll create a training for you. See you at the next perfect time.